and welcome to episode 429 of the Great and Crowbar a gaming podcast being recorded on the 20th of December 2023, which is likely the last podcast of the year, seeing as we're mere days before the seasonal tradition of annihilating ourselves with food. I'm Marsh Davis, a useless piece of cheap plastic tat destined for the landfill, and tonight I'm joined by the unbidden stocking filling Satsuma and the inevitable heartburn of gaming discourse, Chris Thurston and Jamie Britton. Welcome, gents. Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Right, that one kept going, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> and me. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing to both of us at the same time was a bold move, Marsh. <laughs> How has your year in games been? Well, um, much like my Christmas, I'm staggering from one revelation to another in the manner of a man visited by a series of ghosts. Um, <laughs> that's that's been my 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 year. That's been my Christmas so far. Uh, I find myself presently haunted by my own teeth. I'm you <laughs> I'm coming to you live from the sweet spot. Um, of the painkillers that are helping me deal with the open revolt of one of my wisdom teeth against the rest of my face. <laughs> um, I've been to the dentist and the dentist has had a little look around and, and like a plumber sort of said, oh shit, and kind of walked off again. <laughs> and I don't know when he'll return in the new year, perhaps to attack me with a drill. Um, I desperately crave that moment. But otherwise, beyond that, I'm really glad to be back. It's been a long time since I've been on this pod, it feels like. And there's probably a really good reason for that. But more than anything else, it's nice to hear both of your lovely voices. I'm going to shut up now so that I can hear Aww. them some more. Well, it's very nice of you to say. Jamie, your year? Yeah, my year's been fine. I <laughs> I went to the dentist once with uh, infected wisdom teeth. And he took one look in my mouth and just went, yeah, that'll have to come out. And so he just, within seconds, it seemed, had, had numbed me up. And, and and this was like a dodgy dentist, like off the motorway in London, like near a big <laughs> roundabout and was next to a chicken shop. And uh, yeah, he just he just took a big part of my body out of my face and then deposited me on the on the pavement outside. And it felt very strange. Um, normally you would have some sort of warning that someone's going to do that. Um, have I told the story in the pod before about the time that my um, just absolute... Um, lack of initiative and uh, self-respect caused me tremendous problems at the dentist. I don't know if I have. Uh, a few years ago, I had some dental problems, including eating kind of like quite a, you know, um, a wisdom tooth removed and, and some other things. And the wisdom tooth was one thing. And then when I came back for another procedure, the dentist asked me in the same tone that you would ask someone, do you want a biscuit? Do you want anesthetic? And I am programmed to respond to that with, no, don't trouble yourself. I'm all right. And I wasn't. <laughs> I wanted <laughs> I wanted not to just white knuckle that experience, but it did. And it was it sucked so much. It inspired me to write a short story about dark Eldar torture machines. And no joke, that story is how I ended up writing for Black Library. So um <laughs> the <laughs> um you know, just goes to show sometimes being uh, lacking the initiative to simply say yes to a dentist when they offer to take away the the inevitable consequences of the thing they're about to do to your face, um, kind of a silver lining, um, but didn't it's, feel that way in the moment. It's also how L. Ron Hubbard came up with Scientology because he it? was he went to the dentist and he was given you know ether or or whatever to to knock him out, and in that instant he became convinced that he had glimpsed the totality of existence itself, but only for a moment. <laughs> And all of his life was about um, sort of reconstructing what he had glimpsed uh, uh, through, it turned out, a, a very abusive religion. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's where that came from, basically. I think there's, I was reading the, uh, when my tooth started hurting a lot on Saturday, I started reading the NHS website page, you know, because Googling self-diagnosis is a fine part of this experience. Um, like for, you know, the particular thing I was experiencing with my lower wisdom tooth. And one of the symptoms was like malaise, like in addition <laughs> to all the other pain. And I, and like, you know, like a kind, and, and that's right. Because there's something about like having, like, I think there's some deep animal part of me and probably all of us that, that directly associates having a fucked up jaw with 
I guess I'll die. Like, right. and I don't yeah, think yeah. that's a human. I think that goes, I think goes all the way back to the lizard. You know what I mean? That one goes all the way. Most because, lizards need, need their teeth. <laughs> yeah. And well, probably most lizards can regenerate their teeth, right? Like, you know, I guess, I don't know that for sure, but I just assume <laughs> that they can. I'm just going to fucking, I'm going to fucking, I'll, I'll die on that hill, you know, at least, you know, but we can't. And like, yeah, there's just some fucking part of you that's like, well, it's off to the elephant graveyard with me. Like you, my you despise the lizard within for its yeah. ability to grow back what you can only lose. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Should never. I should never have crawled out of the ocean. I thought <laughs> the other morning. It's it's worse in the mornings. You know, I'll, I should never have. I should never have embarked on this journey to just stuck higher with the kind form of, of the, life. The gummier yeah. forms of prey, like you know, uh, jellyfish and stuff. I tend to, but <laughs> it hasn't helped. <laughs> In my day, we were just a bunch of primordial sludge. No one, yeah. no, no one on their phones. No one taking pictures. Just reacting to basic stimuli and producing small bubbles of oxygen every now and again. Right. Yeah. You should yeah. just, uh, you should just try enveloping things and slowly dissolving them through your body mass. That's the way forward. Isn't I it? think I should become oh, an extremely niche YouTuber on this subject. <laughs> this feels like a, uh, this is, you know, I think those those return cowards aren't going all the way. You know what I mean? Like, although in my case, I do want to silence the voice within that says, there is no fixing this, you are doomed. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, if I, you know, like the desperate animal urge to wiggle the painful thing, while also knowing that there might be like one wiggle too far means you will be expelled from the pack. You know what I mean? This um, video is brought to you by World of Tanks. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Read Shadow Legends. Um <laughs> Anyway, I think we were, were, were we talking about games or was I trying to get you to talk about games at some point? You were asking you asked you asked how our years were. I asked yeah. you how your year in games was. But, oh, you know, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> fine. Well, we have a, a fabulous tool for assessing this, don't we? If that's the direction you're, you're, you're digging in. That was, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Steam's done a Spotify. <laughs> it's it's much better than the Spotify one because as anyone listening with kids will know, they are they will destroy your Spotify algorithms uh and and leave you a, a decrepit husk of of no music taste whatsoever because no matter how much you're into that, you know, um peculiar album of, of free jazz or whatever, um they will play uh Say La Vie by Bewitched many, many more times than you could possibly imagine. So it's nice to have a <laughs> <laughs> a Steam year review, which is actually a, an accurate representation of uh, what I've been playing, you know. Although, I mean, the, the way it sort of biases things by by playtime is a little bit misleading because it's just like, oh, did you play a AAA game? That's your favourite game, by the way. <laughs> mm. like, well, yeah, there's one in mind that's particularly it? insulting in that regard. I'll say this for I'll say this for Steam. I am not a person with children, and I've managed to break my own Steam thing through two two uh, two vectors one is using Sp sorry, spotify one is using spotify as a soundtracks for role-playing games you know oh. i just like that's that screwed it up quite badly but really this year, that's been the case for the last couple of years this year i listened to so much quite shit operatic metal while writing <laughs> warhammer stories that spotify thinks i live in finland <laughs> My Spotify is, is in a good place right now, but it sort of uh, it, it sort of goes back and forth between presenting things to me that I that are interesting and things that I absolute hate because it seems like my tastes are quite adjacent to spoken word songs. Mm. And I hate <laughs> spoken word songs, <laughs> but somehow I like all the genres that are closely connected with it. So every every now and again, it just fills my discovery playlist with you know Jarvis Cocker saying things like, ooh, I didn't know you liked biscuits and all this. <laughs> so That was I didn't know you liked biscuits by Jarvis Cooker. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question, though, because I've had to face this now. Because I said something earlier a, a minute ago that I regret. I'll go back to you, but do you genuinely hate spoken word or are you in denial? And Spotify is right. <laughs> I, I like selective spoken word uh -huh. tracks. So I, I like... Uh, um, uh, K Tempest, for example, mm. and uh, I quite like Idols and uh, other things that are quite shouty uh, and spoken, but I do not like um, the Sleaford mods. Right. That seems understandable. Or almost sort of 
poetry adjacent stuff. Not because I, I particularly dislike the poetry, but I it doesn't work for me while I'm drawing or, or, or writing. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you don't I listen to it, sleep at mods while you're drawing. Honestly, what the world going to? <laughs> <laughs> I think I had to face down. I said earlier that I've listened to a lot of like shit metal. A lot of it, I, I, I like, honestly. I think I sort of had to face that down about myself that like if you if some if you listen to something enough that it is in your top ten, you probably like it. And there are probably you know, <laughs> and you know, I went to I went to a great um, like metal and, and noise festival in the summer. That's something I did this year, um, and that was all very edifying in terms of listening to like the good versions of a lot of the things that I will roll around in when I'm on my own. And no one can judge me, but I feel quite seen by Spotify. And it was quite a an, an exposing test of my own like discipline to whether I would <laughs> share what it said about me with the world. You know what I mean? Because I don't necessarily, you know, I don't want my my, my public social media presence has, has dropped off a cliff in the last couple of years anyway. But um, I kind of didn't want to press the share button because I just the act of kind of like nuclear self-exposure that would be revealed by me being like you know what i fucking love bands where a man is a big viking <laughs> <laughs> like just an act of killing the 20 year old version of me <laughs> you know what i mean just like and and being cringe but free i hate to press you guys on a point that you seem reluctant <laughs> to discuss but i'm doing this to try and annoy you now much. I have to <laughs> merry christmas <laughs> my number one game uh, of the year was Baldur's Gate 3 with nice. 20, 20% of my total play time. 106 sessions played with a 14 day streak. And I got so, four, I got several achievements. <laughs> I won't go through the achievements but they're there. I'm interested in how many games did you play because that's the one that sort of was shocking uh, to me in my own case. I played 85 games. Marsh? 42 which I thought was uh, I felt like that wasn't very many. I played 16. Mm. And I really, like, maybe the year's gone very fast. I've been really busy. But, like, my my takeaway from this, this like, I, I looked at it yesterday for the first time, the Steam Year in Review. And obviously I've played one or two things on, on console and on other platforms. So it's not, and you know, other PC, you know, vendors also. But, like, that really does account for most of it. Mm. And... The vast majority of those games, I didn't play for more than 10 minutes. Right. That's what I was, I was actually going to say. Did you like those 16 games? Because I, I imagine after those 42 games, I, uh, maybe uh, <laughs> only four did I not quit as, as fast as uh, I would normally skip a Jarvis Cocker track. Right. Yeah. My The ones like, so I played, I don't know if it says how many hours I played, um, but 51% of my playtime this year was Destiny 2. Um, and then with 275 sessions, followed by Baldur's Gate 3, 21% at 68. Uh, then Call of Duty, which I didn't even think I played it very much. Um, but uh, the the thing Steam tells you if you are if one of your top games is COD, is COD has remained a cultural phenomenon because of dedicated players like you. Oh, God. <laughs> so... It's your like, fault then. Yeah, the <laughs> yeah. burden, of, burden of guilt is high there. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Followed by, and we can return to this, Dota 2, uh, completing a lap of the podcast there. And then finally, Hunt Showdown. And like, oh, cool. And then, yeah, thank you. So I've redeemed myself in Marshy's eyes with one game there. And then, <laughs> you know, I, built, I bought a, a Steam Deck earlier in the year and uh, I have played 94% of my usage of it is Vampire Survivors. And every other game I've played on it has been games I've loaded and then to see if they work and then gone, oh, I could play Elden Ring on this and then not done that. <laughs> <laughs> it's my second second most played game is Vampire Survivors. Nice. Um, they should they should just pack it in with the Steam Deck and maybe not make it yeah. impossible to install any other games on it. it just make it the Vampire Survivor machine because it is really perfect for it. Um, and uh, uh, that game remains a little miracle. I love that game. Who doesn't yeah, love that too. game? It's great. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was quite shocked because it's such a drop off for me from previous years. But I think authentic to where games are in my life at the moment. You know what I mean? It's not like this is, it's not like I, I tried to massage this to make, my look, make myself look bad. <laughs> <laughs> 
What were your top genres? I'm interested in that because I, I, I thought the ones that it provided me, I mean, obviously, well, were accurate, but also it, it, it was descriptive of the genres that I feel like I have massively gravitated towards now. Mine, my genres are FPS, MOBA, tabletop, because a tabletop simulator, which is also up there, mm -hmm. um, Warhammer 40k, because it's dark tired, <laughs> Souls like, uh, because of Remnant, I suspect and action roguelike because of all games. <laughs> Mine is uh, roguelike deck builder, which I guess is because I played a little bit of Slay the Spire and Monster Train at some point. Uh, number two is inventory management. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. I think because I played a lot of Resident Evil 4, like original Resident Evil 4. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, the genre, that main genre of that game, Inventory Man. <laughs> uh, number three, traditional roguelike. Good. Number four, cyberpunk. I think that's just cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if that gets the... Uh, I didn't play that much of that. Uh, five is Souls-like. And six is Colony Sim, which I guess is uh, Dwarf Fortress accounts for that. I didn't realise that the genres were going to sass you. That's pretty good. I, I mind it just de <laughs> detective, uh, action, adventure, puzzle, platformer. Mostly puzzle games I play and mystery. Mm. Mystery. Um, I also got forty k in there as well, but I, I only played Dark Tide for a tiny bit of time, so I, I, I don't know why they've amped up forty k for me. But new yeah. friends added one. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Steam features yeah. you didn't use the workshop. I got two badges. Two badges. How many badges? I got one badge. Can't believe. Whoa! It. Whoa! I need yep. to get good. <laughs> what was your longest streaks? Uh, I don't have it up in front of me now, but actually, I, I don't think it. Uh, I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> like it's just <laughs> none of this matters. <laughs> <laughs> but even, even as like it's a completely useless metric because that's just oh this game was longer than the others. That's all. That's all it means as far as I can tell. I think it was probably La Noire, uh, which I went back to. Uh, and that's that's a long game, so I played all of it, and uh, that, <laughs> it just lasted longer. <laughs> My longest I've... was fourteen days, thirteen of which was Destiny. Good old Destiny. <laughs> it's, I, uh, I sort of identified a few years ago. I'm not going to talk about Destiny too much on this podcast, even though it's apparently the one thing I'm qualified to talk about. Usually, um, when you say that, you then talk about it for uh, forty-five or fifty. I will say this. <laughs> It's had a, you know, honestly, there are probably more broader industry things we could talk about, particularly the rough time Bungie's had lately and the experience people have been laid off and so on. That game has had a rough time this year. But I I think comfort games are a thing, you know, like, and I've been playing that game or some variant of it for a decade now. And it is it become a litmus test in my life for like, if I feel stressed or I need to switch off, I play Destiny now. And I think that's, deep enough in my marrow alongside the part of me that thinks that I'll die because of my tooth <laughs> that, um, that I can't like, I just sort of have to, I just accept it, you know? And, and I don't, I don't, I don't rue that necessarily. Maybe one day I will when my tooth kills me and I have to reflect <laughs> on the choices I've made, but like, you know, it's just, I like it. It's a good game about guns and wizards. The end. Yeah. What was your number one Marsh? My favourite, you mean? No, in your list, your uh, your uh, your top played. Oh, that, that was also La Noire, <laughs> uh, a, a mediocre game that I didn't especially enjoy uh, that much. I can tell you about my favourite games if that's of any interest. Yeah. Um, in, in in no particular order, uh, Jedi Fallen Order and its sequel, Survivor, which I played uh, in in uh, one after the other at the beginning of the year. Shadow Gambit. Talos Principle 2, Cocoon, uh, and Baldur's Gate 3. I think those are my favourite games of the year. And probably Cocoon out of those is my favourite, I would say. Well, to save some time, that's also my favourite game of the year, I think. Uh, yeah! It's, it, it's that's funny. high five with our proboskis. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was, it, I was pleased with that game because we've been talking about it and referring to it for years <laughs> on this podcast as the Beatle Marble game. Uh, and it was exactly as good as I hoped it would be. And yeah, I just think it's 
in a year that has had all these kind of amazing, unwieldy, you know, masterpieces of Baldur's Gate and, uh, you know, Tears of the Kingdom and all this sort of stuff. There's amazing, amazing, you know, design and artistry in there. But I just think Cocoon as an experience, as a kind of incredibly short but incredibly focused and and well put together, and for all it's like, you know, being made out of weird insect parts and anuses and, and, and you know, wings and promoskies as themselves... Uh, it just felt like the most kind of together expression of of kind of of a game that I think I I played and I just yeah loved every second of it. Played yeah. it through in four or five hours. I'll probably never play it again, but it's like like inside. It just kind of now sits inside me uh, quite happily, <laughs> and uh, you know I'm, I'm just happy it's there. Yeah, they really. Uh, it's hard to fault that game. I can't really think of that many things about it that uh, more critical self would even think of changing. Particularly, it's just. It's a, it's almost a, a, an exact expression of, of whatever their intent was. You know, hard to think they didn't exactly nail it. They spent six years making it, which is kind of amazing um, because it's very compact and very short, um, and you can just you can just see you can feel the iteration in there, uh, similar to Tears of the Kingdom as well. I think like the polish is just sky high, and I am a I am a sicko for polish, um, especially <laughs> on that. Especially on that scale, you know, if you've got little things and you've polished them to a high shine, then I am just... Anuses, you know, yes. Anuses, anuses polished, po- <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> anuses polished to a high shine and sphincters, um, you know, opening and closing with a nice, a nice little pop. Yeah, I'm just happy with that. So yeah, I'm happy with my choices. <laughs> <laughs> happy with this. Um <clears throat> Although yeah. I'm like, even though that's that's that is like a, a almost peerless game, uh, I did have just a really cracking, completely uncerebral time with Jedi Survivor. Like that is, that's exactly what I wanted it to be. A big, big dumb game where I can whop mm. things with a lightsaber. I mean, you know. I think that is the only like, like triple A kind of trad action game I finished this year. Um, like I did start. I mean, actually thinking about it. I just, play a bunch of things on the PS5 and I, I really wanted to get around to new Spider-Man, but I mm. committed myself to finishing the first one and all its DLC, which I haven't finished yet. But I did play all of Survivor and I do like it. Like I liked it a lot. I, did, I don't think it would actually like, it's interesting that when I was thinking about like what I have played this year, it was so early in the year that it, it kind of feels like it's from a different era now, but maybe that's just my particular experience of, of the year. Um, I feel like I've been a bit glib earlier about like kind of, just how low that steam number is i think this you know the the more serious answer i think in terms of my relationship with games is that i've either played things in a kind of work capacity as i have done for you know a long a long time and usually off steam um as a kind of research thing but I've, i've had that experience this year of just having dramatically less time for games and um part of that is is work and and being kind of wholly in the industry, I guess, and holding on the dev side and, and relying on when I play games for myself, it tends to be kind of comfort picks. And I could talk about some of the things that have surfaced above that, but nonetheless, um, but also like becoming so much busier um, as a, in terms of writing particularly, that I was thinking about why I didn't remember playing Jedi Survivor. And it's because I had a big writing project this year. I've, I've, I've finished a novel for the first time and that was like, Jedi Survivor was the thing I did as a little treat before doing that. And I don't remember that time anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, I think that's the more serious thing of like, kind of, I, I used to be someone for whom games was my primary form of entertainment. And I think I've arrived at a point where I'm busy enough that that's not quite the case, or it takes a little bit more effort to G myself up for something that's frankly more nutritious than the, 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 the lovely, gruel i like i like to slop into my mouth i'm sorry this is such a mouth-based podcast they t- i mean i appreciate they tend to be but <laughs> <laughs> um i will say like looking at so in terms of things that i played this year and loved um i didn't get a chance to talk about on the podcast i don't think because of aforementioned busyness case of the golden idol i would put mm. up there i appreciate these are probably not gonna be games from this year but i played that this year and loved it yes the um, dlc was great as well well at least one yeah. of the dlc's was great um, I really like, um, I played Burnhouse Lane and enjoyed it. Um, I, I think Elden, sorry, um, not Elden Ring, Vampire Survivors was 
a really big discovery for me. I think I came to it very late, but that, that I think that hit that point of like interesting to find the line between that sort of precise line between something being kind of a casual kind of entertain like attention toy and being something you can kind of meaningfully invest strategy in. I think it straddles that really compellingly. Um, I think Hunt has had a great year anyway, just regardless, and I still play it a lot. And um, I think it's the it's the perennial game that I'm. I think I feel the most compelled to advocate to people who haven't played it, particularly. It, game is there a new? Is there a new boss in it? There's a big old crocodile. A crocodile. There's a big crocodile lives on the shore. Uh, it's the first open world boss, and that's. Um, yeah, really. There's, I mean, it was also just a ton of great changes. Generally, They've, it's just had a big patch because it's its fifth anniversary update just happened, and so um, I, I think it's one of those things where um, it's just. I had a, a round earlier today that was just one of those like great showcases of all the things that game is capable of being. Like, it's a stealth game. It can be a farce. It can be a horror game. And then earlier, while having to kind of solo try and you know try and rescue a downed friend from inside a church that he had died within that I knew had two people in it and using all of its sound systems and gun systems and map map awareness and all of it to try and do that in the kind of a sort of, I don't know, cowboy splinter cell sort of way is like, <laughs> it's fucking great. Hunt. I genuinely think it's amazing. But then, and then the one that I'll, you know, if, if we have time, I'll talk about more details, Baldur's Gate 3, which is, I think it maybe used to be the case that I would, sort of absolutely obsessed with and hundred percent a couple of RPGs a year. And this year it's been only the one Baldur's Gate. I really want to play cyberpunk again. That's probably the next thing I'll play, but um, I put a lot of time into Baldur's Gate this year. And that that is probably so far and away my game of the year. And truthfully, probably a game of the decade that um, yeah, um, it's, it's not even a competition. I mean, you're welcome to talk about it now if you like. Uh, only if you, if you don't mind. I appreciate what people talked about it on the pod a bunch. Um, and also, I don't, I, I mean, I feel like they're not like, no one's on tenterhooks waiting to find out if this game is good or not after it's <laughs> swept. It's swept all of the, you know, so, you know, all of the accolades you could wish for. Uh, PC gamers, highest ever score, loads of golden joysticks, um, 20 to 25 seconds of Jeff's attention. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, Chris. I, I did just want to say, can you wrap it up, please? Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the same joke at the same time. Um, uh, yeah, but yeah. So I don't want to. I don't want to like. I think I'll try and I'll try and narrow down why I I have had such phenomenal time with it. And to give a bit of context, I have finished one sort of maximalist run, and I. I tend to, with a big RPG like this, and it's grabbed me in a way that I think a game, an RPG like this hasn't probably since Dragon Age Origins, um, which was itself the first time I had felt that way a game since, like, Baldur's Gate. So, you know, it's kind of recursive in that way, I suppose. I really admired the Divinity games, but they didn't grab me quite like this has. I think it's through a consequence of, uh, I think, just to gloss over that, I think Larian, I think their world building has, or their Obviously, they're, in this case, they're using an, uh, an existing license, but they've done a lot of their own world building to kind of make it their own. I think their world building is more mature. I think the art direction and everything else is made it more appealing to me than Divinity and the more sensible kind of arrangement of their systems. I think you were dead on, Jamie, in, in, when you talked in the past about how well it navigates funneling, channeling you into its systemic breadth and then letting you go nuts at the end. And I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but my first run throughs with games like this tend to be I tend to see them as like scouting missions. Like I'll be more refined and more kind of like, you know, interesting, frankly, in subsequent runs. My first runs always tend to be, I want to kind of get a feel for everything. I want to see everything. And I'm not going to be shy about saves coming and things like that. I think with Baldur's Gate, I settled into this attitude to saves coming, which was the using quick load to see things, to, to find out what might happen, to play with the systems was a, a way of getting that kind of information through my first run and, and testing it a little bit. But also it fills in, I think, the one thing that that game struggles with that pen, the, the tabletop doesn't. Because it's such a remarkable, um, it's such a remarkably successful, I think, adaptation of many elements of 5th edition D&D to a CRPG. And, but my experience of 5th edition D&D has been that 
it tends to be a game that benefits from like a fairly you know improvisational and occasionally open-minded sort of back and forth with the dm right you should feel free to rewrite rules on the fly and obviously in the context of a an a, a, a crpg they've already done some you know very lots of you know house rules certainly they've, they've amended the rules in many ways but obviously it can't be dynamic with that it can't do that on the fly to make an experience just a little bit richer or to account for something that maybe the system hasn't accounted for and obviously that game is so kind of rich in interaction that they get quite far to that feeling anyway and for me quick save quick load saves coming was like the missing piece that allowed you to kind of negotiate with the gm a little bit it kind of reminds me of the times in um you know, the, yeah, I think that in any pen and paper experience, which is also quite a lot of this year, you need the opportunity occasionally for a bit of a, ta- a takey backsey um, when you don't, inter- you know, when you and the GM are at cross purposes about what the outcome of something might be. Not in terms of a dice roll, but in terms of, oh, I didn't think that, you know, I, I, that's not what I meant, <laughs> basically, by that thing I did. And so for me, it kind of felt like getting this sort of like quite solipsistic, but kind of, because I played it single player, but really rich um incredibly well produced and lavish uh, and long tabletop campaign to sort of laid out in front of me for me to 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 wallow around in and so that was you know i think sort of um the spirit with which i went into it and then the this has actually never happened to me before normally when i finish a game like this i am like i'm sated and i'm ready to move on to something else for a bit but i'm more you know i will come back to it and i'll probably play the same thing again with Baldur's gate i got back to the main menu after an initial 145 hour playthrough and then just started a new one um because <laughs> i just wanted to keep going and as the campaign had wrapped up i'd started to have ideas for paths that i hadn't gone down um that i'd seen teased at as i started to kind of commit more to like my decisions and so on and I should stress, I'm not like going back and redoing big chunks of the game, but I will kind of tease out particular things, particular encounters. Um, and I, yeah, I think it's like, it's almost too kind of um, big to unpack in a lot of ways. I'd hopefully kind of dive into a few things. I'll say a few things that I think um, it is clear that they had to reduce scope to ship it, I think, particularly from the third act. And I think that that is clear but isn't to its detriment you know i don't think anyone is saying that like a 140 40 hour game is lacking in um you know uh content <laughs> and stuff to do but one thing i really admire about it and i'll kind of add this to the point you made jamie about like how it in delivering you to Baldur's gate at the end of the game solves the big town problem by sending you finally into the big city, but with like a big list of like, with with strong preferences for what you want the outcome of that to be, and therefore a, a much stronger internal compass. The The other thing I would layer on it is, and I really like that they did this, and I, I hope that more games mimic it. You hit the level cap, and in many ways the power cap for your character quite early, relative to where, like if you were thinking of it as a kind of curve that would take you all the way to the game, where you would. And it's sort of, in my, my own plays, playthroughs, and I think in Friends, it's basically as you get to Baldur's Gate, you're probably about, if you've done a decent amount of it, you're probably on the cusp of level 12, which is its cap. And you've almost certainly accrued piles and piles of scrolls and potions and one-off abilities and so on. And I really liked this because it felt like, for me, weirdly, the game began in Act 3 because I kind of was mucking my way through to that point. And then I arrived in Act 3 as like a really powerful character with a really powerful range of abilities at my disposal and then loads of really powerful companions. And I loved the way it just sort of goes completely nuts and escalates the um, the encounter design particularly. And I think it reveals something about the game, which is like I have played and loved games like Dragon Age, Dragon Age 2, like, um, you know, even early Mass Effect, where the, the gameplay side of things is something I will happily play but I'm just trying to kind of like nibble at little shreds of atmosphere because I'm, you know, if I wanted to play a shooter, there's probably a better option. Or if I wanted to, you know, play a kind of, you know, a, a, a sort of turn-based or a kind of real-time with pause act- uh, strategy game, I would have a better option than maybe Dragon Age 1, for example. And there's a moment, there was a moment for me where Baldur's Gate became also one of the most fun turn-based strategy games and immersive sims I'd ever played. 
through the quality of its later encounters. Um, and it's where to land the point about saves coming where that became essential because there are sequences where you have two divergent paths in how you could approach them, not in terms of what you as in your mindset as a player, both of which are equally rewarding. And it's remarkable that that's true in both cases. One of them is your party is put in an impossible situation and it's extremely unlikely that you'll get a perfect outcome. The game is incredibly reactive and will, um, go with what happens the vast majority of the time into quite a granular level of detail. And therefore it's very rewarding to kind of commit. And that's what's done in subsequent playthroughs. Like if something goes sideways, if somebody dies, that's it. You know, that's kind of the story that you're being told. The other way to play those sequences is to identify that like, oh, okay, the game doesn't think is challenging you here to see if you can get the good outcome. And there's, there's so many really good examples of this, like moments where the difficulty spikes massively, but in really interesting ways, or there's a sequence in particular that I won't spoil because I think it's still, it's, d- it's deep in the game and it's still, you know, close enough, I think, and people still playing it. But where you arrive in a place that you've been told not to go to because you know that it's full of vulnerable hostages. And if you go there, the villain has the ability to just doom all of those people by, you know, effectively, in without spoiling it, activating the self-destruct. And you can press ahead. You can say, I don't care, I'm going anyway. And then it'll stick you in that environment and say, all right, champion, you've got 10, you've got six turns to to unfuck this situation that you've caused. And, um, and the environment is on paper far too big. There are far too many people stuck there. You've basically just doomed all these people. And I had this moment where I was using every single trick I had, every single spell, teleport, environmental trick to solve that to do the kind of miraculous thing where everybody survives. And it's genuinely, it was, that was the, that, you know, couple of hours I spent loading and reloading that scenario, like sort of Groundhog Day style to kind of find the perfect sequence of events that would allow me to kind of achieve this, you know, very difficult seeming thing. That was the most fun I've had in a game this year. And that was purely systemic. You know, the fact that there was like big story beats that happen in the course of that. And the fact that has this story payoff is like, this extraordinary icing on the cake. And that was, I think the moment when it was like, oh shit, I, I, this is the best CRPG I've ever played. And it's the first one in so many years to kind of like reignite that really deep love for that genre. Now that I'm, I think more wise to the things that I don't like about them, if that makes sense. I appreciate sure I've just talked for like 20 minutes straight about Bob's gear. It feels like it, but that, I think that that I don't can't really think of another game that gets both sides of it right to that extent. The because I haven't even talked about the things I really enjoyed about its writing and performances and so on. To get all of that right and build a really interesting strategy game on top of it, I think it's just really remarkable. Yeah, I think that's very well said. I think <clears throat> the thing I kind of was most striking about it really was to me was how much of it is focused on <laughs> you as a player like mm. your story in this world your creativity your your actions your your morality your romances like really really fixated on the player character whoever that is um and that felt really refreshing you know i i, I played mass effect relatively recently last year i think and it was striking you know how much is focused on that game obviously has its problems but like how much of that is focused on expressing yourself through a, through a character and i really didn't realize how rare that is in a game in a funny kind of way to actually lean into that idea of being able to express yourself emotionally and physically and <laughs> sexually in Baldur's Gate there's lots, <laughs> lots of opportunities for that um you know that just that just feels pretty unique in this day and age and you you don't see very much of it you know yeah i think there's also something i will say for it as well is it is it's really full of like best moments. And I don't think there's very much, even though it's such a big game, personally, I don't think there's very much fat on its bones. And actually like, I think the inevitable game of the year edition or director's cut is going to be fucking massive. (laughs) You know what I mean? When they, when they have the ability to put things in, but you know, you gestured at it actually, I think previously on the pod, Jamie, when I listened to it, like that there's a sequence in act three that involves, you know, a gratuitous sex scene and a musical number, I think was the way you put it that is that you could miss completely that is such a like it feels like one of those moments where you're playing a pen and paper game and you're 
you know, your dungeon master or your game master has just decided to kind of level up for the day. You know what I mean? And like knock it out of the park far more than they need to in terms of like just really going hard into a particular experience. It's so kind of rewarding. And like, I think it's, yeah, I, I don't know if you felt this way, Jamie, but like, it's really rare for me in a CRPG to be excited every time you have to roll initiative and fight something because it's going to be cool and interesting. I can't really think of another game that's really achieved that with the regularity that Baldur's Gate 3 does. No, I, I would absolutely agree. And it is just, it's it's just kind of popping and sparking at you whenever you play it. That's the thing. Like the world is so reactive and responsive and everything you do matters and has weight. And, you know, that's just unique. And And I think one of the things that's like, that's also really exciting about it is is what comes next and it's been such a watershed moment for the games industry not least because it's a crpg which has never been one of the you know main normally a crpg has to be kind of passed through another filter right like right like so fallout becomes the you know the, the 3d fallouts or something like that you know or mass effect is a is a um is a shooter you know a cover shooter as well and this one feels like such a balls out <laughs> all things out um crpg and has been so wildly successful that it feels like oh there's going to be lots of really interesting narrative focused projects coming down the pike and I'm, I'm sure some very bad ones <laughs> but i you know whatever comes next is just superbly exciting for me as someone who kind of cares a lot about you know narrative in games and uh is now employed in narrative in games and yeah i i think the promise of what comes next from Larian and, and others as well is is super exciting. Oh yeah, and I think I think you're right, and I think I think there's a ton I could talk about. Narr- I've almost not talked about it narratively, almost pointedly, because it's it's also the field that I work in. But I think the thing, and there's so much I could say about it. I think that it works really, really extremely well. I think, um, and I don't apologies if I'm repeating something from the pod here, but like something that I think is extremely successful about it is it it has a great setup for a story that encompasses a wide range of like player moralities for one thing by which is rooted in the fact that it's not a save the world story not in the traditional sense it's a save yourself story and that can be inflected in a lot of different interesting ways and i think the thing that prevents that from being sort of feeling too well i think it's a really successful kind of recalibration of expectation of the scope of a fantasy story or a genre story like this that it's okay to have a big dramatic story about what your own life means to yourself and what you're willing to sacrifice and about what your what it means to survive and how that is inflected through all the different characters in it because it's got some like every single like I, I love it and i'll say this with love every single com- character in it is kind of the same um and that could have been a weakness basically every single character is a a horny version of the bus from speed that has been cursed by god that's everyone (laughs) in it right everyone in it has 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 like everyone in it has like accidentally drunk texted god and now will explode (laughs) if they slow down that's 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 baldur's gate and rather than that feeling like okay this game's got one thing and it's doing lots of different ways it becomes this really sort of interesting exercise in like a bunch of weirdos discovering what they value about each other which is to me a bit more interesting and you know humane than a bunch of weirdos realize that they have complementary skills which will help them stop the bad explosion or whatever it is right um and you know i don't know i think there's there's, there's a ton i can say about that and i think that i think it's the reason it's resonated with people quite as hard as it has is because it's so focused on on personality. The other thing I want to praise it for before I start talking about it is it has one other thing which I love and I hope is, I am sure is absolutely deliberate, which is they there's a degree of effort applied to um, naming characters in Baldur's Gate, which is not even, it's not evenly distributed. And it accurately reflects what it's like to name characters in any pen and paper role playing game or Dungeons and Dragons. I.e., if a character is important, you'll give quite a lot of thought to their name. And that will usually mean one of three things like open, sort of just full, let's embrace this fantasy nonsense, like Shadow Heart. It will mean a real name that you spell in a fun way, um, like Lazel. Or it will be um, the, no- the, the most. The name of an extremely Tory child being shouted at in a waitress, 
like Asterian, for example. Um, <laughs> and then, but for everyone on the periphery, they're named in, in as if, as if in witnessing this character, you've frightened a DM into naming them on the fly. Like when a player in real life says, oh yeah, that guy in the corner, what's he called? And you just sputter, oh, Bunt Chugly. <laughs> or Zombo Pumbo, both of which are real names <laughs> from Bar of the Gate. I fucking love that they did that. They had the choice to spend a lot more time not calling that character Zombo Pumbo, but they went for it to achieve a kind of verisimilitude that I very much appreciated. <laughs> and that's the final laurel I will pile on top of that game. Um, there's I, a yeah, yeah. there's a, uh, a friend of mine who uh, is sort of my oldest mate, and he he kind of plays games, but he's not sort of involved in, he doesn't listen to podcasts, he just sort of plays what's out. And he sent me a screenshot of uh, a shield he picks up in Baldur's Gate, which is called the Real Sparky Sparks Wall, which is an uncommon <laughs> shield. Lightning aura. And then the quote, the law quote on it says, quote, is there anything as beautiful as lightning striking all around you? End quote. Eri the spark struck said, letting lightning strike all around them. <laughs> <laughs> There's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. It's a very funny game as well. Like, that's the other thing that's worth saying for it. It's um, very adroit. Is, is that how you pronounce that word? I don't think I've ever said that out loud before. Um, with tone, and I really appreciate that about it as well, without it being goofy. Anyway. Yeah, or, so, or, sort, of, or sort of, or meme It's not yeah. meme or, or quippy. It's just, like, funny, <laughs> which is Yeah, weird. that's crucial. It's funny because the characters are funny. Yeah. That's and that's that's I think the key thing about it. It's not hanging a lampshade on things. It's just characters get an opportunity to kind of rib each other. Like you can be cursed to randomly ejaculate later in the game, and <laughs> when that happens, your char- your companions react to it as if that's actually happening with a, like a re- like with a really on point. You know, it's a re- like that is as close as the game comes to like open like you know, like Leslie Nielsen comedy sort of farce, <laughs> right? Like that's, you know, as close as it comes to like just putting a whoopee cushion under you, except it's a sexy whoopee cushion. Um, and, and also, they, they, sorry, we have had to embol- embroider thank that. You for, whoopee thank cushion. you for stopping me. <laughs> What's the whoopee cushion for love, Chris? <laughs> Jizz. Oh, God. Um, but like, I love, <laughs> I love that, for example, they'll, they'll do a thing. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that one's that one's uh, still still having an impact on me. That one, um, like they will do a thing where they will write funny lines, which are lines that your character will speak, and therefore won't have to be le- read out loud. So they don't have to sell the line in dialogue. Right. So sometimes it will be a funny joke that will only really work on the page, right? It'll only really work as a as a string of text, um, and just having the kind of confidence to do that, like your character's lines aren't voiced, so you can have a bunch of funny jokes in there which don't actually need to be said out loud, kind of Guybrush Freepwood sort of style, which is just wonderful, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that, like, it's kind of, it's embrace of anticlimax, I think, is also really funny. I think that's 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 where the kind of the tone and the narrative work really well together. Because I think if it was a really self-serious game, the systemic side of it would become less fun. Like I had a extremely, this was a one. This wasn't a safe scum moment. I almost actually safe scummed out of it because it denied me some loot. But I was fighting a fucking bad man, a bad man who's been built up for hours as this big villain. I'm fighting him in a fantasy whirlwind of things, just stuff everywhere, big stakes, big stakes moment. And I have the ability. I have telekinesis. Can I just throw him into a hole? It's a <laughs> it's a six percent chance or something of this working, but it fucking worked. Like mid, like grand opening of the encounter, he just got kind of yoinked and unceremoniously deposited into a space hole, and he's dead now. And that, you know, that was a and like a comic anticlimax that felt very much like a tabletop game, and it was supported by the sort of general kind of sort of tone of the rest of that playthrough. But yeah, what a what a wonderful thing it is. I'm I'm so pleased for them. Like it's it's you know, um it's such a cool thing to see Larry and sort of you know, step into this sort of role as like, you know, maybe the place that Bioware used to sit in or something like that. Those are my Baldur's Gate thoughts. There would be more, but I become self conscious about how many there are. Your bald takes and Baldur's Gate. Baldur's take. Alan's 
takes weeks. <laughs> I've been playing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did start playing the Alan Make remaster on the PlayStation. If you want an Alan take, but I don't really have one beyond. I think this is my one take on that. I think fundamentally for me, I enjoy Remedy games. I think Alan Wake's core mechanics are them tying probably both of their arms behind their back, right? They're good at diving around in slow motion, shooting nonsense guns. I don't really care about having to ghostbuster a a lonely woodsman. I would tend to to agree. I mean, there's just no escaping. And I said this on the last podcast, we talked about it. Alan Wake... As a character, he just sucks. He's just awful. There's nothing good about him. He's rubbish. And building an entire game and universe around him is not without merit. You know, Alan Wake 2 is an uh, interesting game, I think, at the very least. But God, Alan Wake himself fucking sucks so badly. I hate that guy. Do you think you'll you, do you think you'll make it to number two, Chris? I, th- I would like to. I'd like uh, having listened to the two of you discuss it. I, I would like to play it. And, and I think I saw someone in Discord describe me as like the the resident remedy liker and i will apologize for all of their nonsense in some ways like i love max Payne. i think it's it's juvenile and i think it's it's kind of juvenilia in some ways for for that studio right like but i think i always find it kind of quite rich and atmospheric despite its strange pastiche of its source material um i think i, I would like RIP, to play yeah yeah. R.I.P. Uh, James McCaffrey as well. He died. Uh, yes, yesterday, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yesterday. Yeah, very sad. And um, so I'd like to, and I like control as well. I, I thought your discussion about their particular pastiche is, is really interesting, and I, I think it's. I don't want to comment really until I played Armic Two, but I'm curious to see if it confirms or denies any kind of concerns I have about their ability to elevate the things they're lifting. But I think the showmanship has always been very strong. Um, if nothing else. Shall I talk about what I've been playing? Yeah. Yeah! Give us a new thing. So I've been playing, I'm going to talk about three little indie-ish games, um, if that's all right. Uh, the first one is Cult of the Lamb, which is a game from last year, which had kind of passed me by. They recently did a sort of social media thing where they talked about, they did a tweet where they were like, if this gets so many likes, we're going to add sex to the game, which um, entirely worked on me and I bought the game. <laughs> um, not based on that, but just because it made me laugh as a campaign. Um, and yeah, it is a, a roguelike, action roguelike, as, as all games are now. And uh, you play as a, a little cute lamb who has to go and slay some people before, uh, well, you're made the kind of leader of this cult by this Lovecraftian entity that exists below this land. And then you have to kill these sort of four priests before uh, he is released and you are his emissary. And it has a kind of Hades-like um, sort of uh, fighty uh, uh, dodge around uh, smash barrels layer and then a, a, a management layer where you are managing a cult um, where you're growing crops and uh, issuing uh, religious decrees and sacrificing people to your uh, eldritch god and cleaning toilets and various other activities. Um, the first thing to say about it is that it's beautifully presented. Again, the Polish, the Polish loving, loving boy in me is is very happy with uh, Cult of the Lamb. Um, I've often found with some of the games that Devolver have put out that they are very shiny and beautiful and kind of quippy to look at. And then I often find myself sort of putting them away uh, quite quickly. Um, But this one I was really, really into. I think one thing I was really impressed with is the scale of it. It's a uh, a roguelike, but I think I only died, you know, 10 or so times across my entire playthrough which lasted about 12 hours to see the ending of the game. You know, there is a post-game as well. Um, but it just felt like a, a, a version of the kind of Hades model that I could much easier get along with. Um, so the loop of it is just super satisfying. You're not dying constantly. It's not punishing you like that. You're building up your cult, which is done very charmingly, and like you know, planting seeds and, and picking pumpkins and 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 things like that. I think it's just really interesting to play a game which takes that action roguelike structure and then builds that into a game which isn't intending to be a you know a massive life uh, you know encompassing Hades kind of 
experience, but is scaled down to the right level where it doesn't feel like a ripoff for, you know, the sort of thing that you'll happily play 20 quid for and you'll happily play for 15 hours or maybe more and really feel like you've got your money's worth. Lovely sense of humor, um, lovely little emergent bits and bobs and really good sounds when you pick vegetables or collect your uh, followers uh, fervor, which you use as various currencies to um, pick up and stuff like that. I was finding myself getting really into all of the little UI pops and boops and and satisfying little clicks that it deploys to kind of keep you keep you invested. Um, yeah, and, and just generally, I was I really enjoyed the idea of of an action roguelike being a little bit less um, focused on skill and kind of you know grognardy get goodness, and actually being a much more um, amiable experience that actually wants players to kind of uh, have fun and and complete the game. Um, without kind of robbing itself entirely of challenge. And then there's a nice little post-game campaign, which I'll probably dive back into later. Um, but yeah, that's that's Cult of the Lamb. And, you know, it's, it's got a couple of DLCs coming out, which will be interesting to play. Uh, one coming quite soon. That's the one that's going to add sex to the game, which is <laughs> kind of... What do you uh, feel gonna... sex is going to add? <laughs> I don't know. I think, you know, the game is kind of... The game is interesting because you have all your little followers who are these, um, you know, little dogs and cats and animals and stuff like that. And uh, you can customize their appearance to an extent. And there's lots of customization options available, which I didn't engage with at all because I kind of like the cute little things that they have. I think what sex is going to add to the game is the ability to, like, you know, breed to cosmetics together to create a new cosmetic which is no bad thing um it sounds quite good fun but yeah I, i'm not quite sure if it's going to be a kind of fundamental game changing dynamic although you never know <laughs> um but yeah it, it, it's a game that feels kind of achievable and and yeah I, I just felt like i'd i'd had a really lovely experience with it and and this year i've spent the entire year playing AAA games that i haven't bothered to play um in the past and it's been really nice to play this. And also the other game I've been playing, which is Dave the Diver, which is obviously a big breakout hit this year, um, which I'll only talk about briefly because, again, the thing I think it does really well is switch register pretty much constantly. Um, it's essentially a collection of mini games. There's a diving game. There's a farming game. There's a cook, serve, delicious game in there as well. And then like literally 20 different gameplay levels that have employed. And I just think that's such a confident trick to try and pull off. Like normally I think with games, they try and do one or at the very most two things really well. And Dave the Diver, yeah, like really goes goes for it in terms of um, how much it tries to do. Um and how much it succeeds at, and how much it all feels like it's you know part of the same game and the same universe. Um, yeah, I just only sort of dipped my toe in that game, as it were, but uh, really, really enjoying it. The pixel animation cutscenes that you have when your chef learns a new dish are amazing and completely beautiful. They're kind of like these manga anime character intros. Um, and also, <laughs> one thing I wanted to point out that I really, really love is that occasionally you'll get a sort of cynical person come into the sushi bar that you're in charge of sort of uh, running and, and stocking with fresh fish, and they'll be a kind of grumpy person with some sort of mad gimmick. Um, and when you finally give them the perfect piece of, of sushi, they will evolve um, like a Pokemon into a new plane of existence, and that's uh, really very funny um, indeed. The lead character looks like me, which I'm always happy with for me representation is <laughs> short fat guy uh so that's good um and yeah i just i really recommend it it's it's really fun it's really sweet it's really amiable um and you know they've just made the shit out of it basically and uh uh yeah there's a dlc for that just coming out i think very soon the crossover with dredge <laughs> which is also and the other fishing indie game that came out this year but the game i want to talk about mostly is this game that i forgot i wanted to talk about which is called witchfire have you ever you encountered witchfire it rings a bell but i might be getting it confused with dreadfire which one is witchfire i think i'm thinking wildfire what's witchfire <laughs> oh shit yeah 
there, there have been a few games with with this particular set of uh, of words uh, arranged in various ways. Witchfire is a game made by um, veterans of the people who made like Bulletstorm, and oh. then they the first game they made was The Vanishing of Ethan Carter, um, which is right. a game I really, really, really didn't like at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, it's one of the early sort of walking simulators and was very bad, I think. So they're um, a small Polish team. The game tells you that it's made by 12 people when it first starts up. Um, and it's it's really interesting. It's really unusual. It's beautiful. It's Unreal Engine 4. Um, and it's a first-person shooter roguelike um, where you play as a kind of witch huntery type person with destiny shooting and jumping. Um, and it's essentially single player hunt showdown. <laughs> like it, that that's the kind of word salad that's going on in this game. Um, but I'm really enjoying it. It's in early access. I think there's only two levels so far. And essentially you are a witch huntery type person who's trying to track down a witch or a witch's familiar in this kind of desolate, dark, soulsy landscape. You have guns, you have spells, you have magic powers that can be upgraded by collecting the titular witch fire is essentially your souls. And you're essentially making runs out into the wilderness, shooting people and trying to make it back to your portal uh, to get back to your base to upgrade your stuff um, before the kind of... uh, level of uh before it gets too difficult and you have to kind of escape basically it has a kind of rising level of difficulty and sort of monsters coming at you at once and each time you clear out a certain area the the level becomes more and more dangerous so it has that kind of risk reward loop um to it it has really good hunt showdown humming music which is always good um <laughs> this, you know i feel like more people should <laughs> uptake that particular idea uh, and yeah, the destiny jumping is really good. You start out with a sol- solid uh, a double jump, which is really nice to have, um, and a kind of dash move as well. But it's nicely simple, um, and it also has this thing that I think is sort of undersold about roguelites, which is you have this deepening understanding of the the kind of game you're playing as you go. Right, it starts off and you're kind of like, okay, this is sort of like modern day Hexen or something like that. Um, and then as it goes on, you feel yourself kind of being drawn into this weirder idea of, of what this game is and the sort Wait, of things it, you're going to be doing. It, it's modern. It's set yeah. in the modern day. And, oh, it's just because no, no, the, the, the aesthetic no, no, of it looks... Um... It's not set in the modern day, no. Okay, looking at the screenshots, it's very confusing because some of it looks like, oh, this is we're, we're in a the fantasy 18th century, and then... Uh, then there's a gun with what appears to be you know one of those fancy ACOG sights on it. Oh yeah, so so that's slightly burying the lead. So you are set in like oldie timey witchy times, definitely the witch right. the witch era. But yes. you do have <laughs> you do have machine guns and automatic pistols and uh, stupid stuff like that. So everyone else is coming at you with muskets, and you have chain guns and machine guns and 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 ridiculous shit like that. So yeah, it also has destiny guns <laughs> in a uh, in a uh, oldie timey setting. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, It's in early access. I think they're going to come out in the next couple of years. Um, And it still feels pretty early access, like a good deal of it is is blocked off. It's just really unusual. It feels like one of those games which is a bunch of people exactly making the kind of game they want to make. Um, And it's weird. It's very weird. And I just... I'm I'm kind of every time I boot it up, I don't quite know what's going to happen next. There's all sorts of mechanics which involve sort of hunt showdown style kind of summonings and banishings and and that kind of variety of things. And I don't really know what they look like, and that makes it feel genuinely mysterious and odd. Um, not knowing what's going to happen next or how the game is going to articulate uh, sort of beyond the early stages. So it might be one that I report back on a bit. But yeah, it's it's genuinely a genuinely unique game, I think, um, and one I'll definitely kind of keep an eye on. I think it's really nice to see things sort of. Um, it feels like there's a parallel universe where the things that really caught on about like early FPSs was like Quake One's architecture or Hexen, right? Rather than pointedly Quake Two, <laughs> and. Uh, I, I approve of the return to like, what if you were trapped with a skeleton, but you had a shotgun, i.e. the Evil Dead 
uh, <laughs> paradigm, <laughs> right? Like um, just somewhere between, you know, the kind of Warhammer witch hunter aesthetic and uh, Evil Dead and Quake lies this very specific atmosphere that I do miss, I think. It feels like uh, uh, particularly Polish <laughs> video game mm. uh, developers are very, very good on this particular form of uh, of, of the genre. Uh, I don't know if you saw recently there is this uh, trailer um, for this game, which I think is a company out of, out of Poland, or they might actually be Russia. Don't quote me on that. But it's certainly from that same sort of antecedent, which is this game where there's this giant policeman watching you in this small town. <laughs> have you seen this? <laughs> I have seen a picture of it, yeah, or maybe a clip on It's pretty extraordinary, this game where you're you're literally it, trapped in a, a small town uh, and there is a giant policeman who sits in the centre of the map watching your every move and you have to uh, kind of escape from him. Uh, it looks completely mad. I love it. Maybe we'll put the link for the trailer in the show notes because it does look genuinely balmy. Is it called Miliciona? Yes, that's the one. Yes, yes. that's the one, yeah. By tall boys, appropriately, because it is a very <laughs> tall boy in the game. <laughs> that would be a great setup for a kind of asymmetric multiplayer version of GTA. Maybe in VR or something. <laughs> yeah. Like one of you, <laughs> the VR player is watching things unfold at their feet as a kind of kaiju police dispatcher. <laughs> and everyone else is a rascal. There you go. That's a free idea for GTA 6. <laughs> There's that game called The Sentinel, wasn't there, back in the olden days, where you had to avoid basically the hour of Eye of Sauron while you kind of crept around a kind of mm. landscape. And you're sort of, yeah. Yeah. One, a, one, yeah. one player plays as God, and the rest of you are rascals. Right. The rascals must try and kill God. <laughs> <laughs> That's also basically the premise of natural selection. <laughs> um, I mean the game natural selection, oh. not the Darwinian oh, right. process natural selection. Although both, in many ways, rascals they... kill God. Yeah, that's yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rascals kill God is also the plot of every D and D campaign, and therefore <laughs> the plot of Baldur's Gate. That's not a spoiler. It's just the plot of every single thing. That so yeah, maybe that is the the kind of the uh, narrative. What are we if not? What if what is it if not rascalry to claw claw your way out of the ocean, <laughs> grow teeth and die? Uh, uh, what have you what have you been playing lately, Marsh? Well, I mean, uh, how, how's your face doing, Chris? Can your face take my takes? My face has shot out so much bollocks today <laughs> that I think I would be a, a social faux pas at this the festive period for me to not. Um, not welcome that with wholeheartedly, which is to say, apart from that run on sentence disaster I just embarked on, <laughs> I feel fine. Go for it. Good. Okay. Well, just so you know, if you're, if you have died of having a tooth by the end of my diatribe, <laughs> then uh, it's not my fault. It's if that happens, know that this is what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've been, um, uh, I haven't had much time recently because I've been traveling first back to the UK to do family stuff. And then uh, I spent a few days in Greece. And um, uh, so I knew that when I got back, I'd just have this huge pile of games because this game, you know, this year has been a, a glut of amazing games. I haven't nearly played even a small percentage of them. And I knew that I'd have this huge pile and I'd have to really crack on with before the year is over. Uh, so naturally, upon getting back from Greece, I immediately installed Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Uh, which I have obviously already <laughs> played. And I did this specifically to play the tourist mode and revisit some of the sites that I'd literally just been in, in Athens, uh, but in their digitally recreated 5th century BC form. And and it was, I don't know if you have these experiences, but it, you know, in the, you have those slightly embarrassing moments in life where your f immediate referent for something, like something immediately reminds you of a distinct gaming moment, mm. which is, of course, itself attempting to ape life in a way which just creates this uh, aruborous of, of nonsense. But like as I was, you know, before I'd even been to those places in Athens, while I was coming into land, it struck me just how like apposite the geography of, of Athens and the area around it is for Assassin's Creed. Because <laughs> like I, I was, you know, swooping down. I was like, wow, I'm synchronizing. Because <laughs> <laughs> not, not just because I was like up high, but because the landscape around Athens is 
unlike, for example, some of the other settings Assassin's Creed has been in, specifically England, the, the landscape around Athens is really vertically varied and accentuated, and it's incredibly densely packed together. And you can literally, as the plane is banking around, uh, you know, hearing the sound of the eagle in my head, you can pick out the interesting landmarks that you're definitely going to go to <laughs> as, as you're coming down. Um, so, that, I mean, that immediately, obviously, I, I, I was put in mind of Assassin's Creed. But then I also wanted to see, having visited uh, those sites, I wanted to see how Assassin's Creed, through its its tourist mode, which is like an educational mode you can turn on, which removes all the combat and everything else, I wanted to see how it dealt with narrating the history of those places because i found the actual information at the sites uh, specifically the acropolis to be awful like uh, even even knowing some of the history of those places the displays there were just so dense with terms that i couldn't parse or or they they were so full of details the relevance which i couldn't possibly know without having like a much greater existing contextual understanding um and i i, I you know uh, I have sympathy with this because it's it's not easy necessarily to do that, and and like history doesn't have a, a beginning or an end, so every, and everything relates to everything else. So you, you know, just describing the Acropolis, which has its own extremely long history, is obviously going to be a difficult thing to kind of compact into a single board. Like those plaques reminded me of another thing that I, in a game I saw recently. Um, I actually don't know what game it's from. I just saw like a screenshot of, of it on on Blue Sky. Uh, I opened it in another tab because every time I went back to it, it made me chuckle. But it's this it's this screen from a game, and there's this picture of some manga looking, small nosed, big hair dude who's lovingly admiring a sword with a map in the background, and it's captioned. As the Galgastani armies emerged from the Psyonji Weald, word of Balbatos's plans reached Denham. <laughs> it's just, which is just a very enjoyable thing to say, but, you, you know, a lot of the way the information was presented at the Acropolis was, was seemingly unintelligible. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, not to sound too ungrateful, Athens is very interesting, and it was great. It was just absolutely awe-inspiring to walk around the those those sites particularly as there weren't very many tourists there this time of year but anyway as it turns out assassin's creed odyssey's tourist mode does an absolutely excellent job far better than the academics and the and the uh, archaeologists uh, of contextualizing those places and their purpose there's loads of information uh, available to you but it's arranged in such a way that it is really easily imbibed uh, you can sort of like access different levels of depth uh, in a in a very fluid and consensual way. There's stuff in there also that I I don't really know why. But I guess for like some sort of political sensitivity wasn't available on site. The information at the Acropolis doesn't really talk in any depth about the interaction of those sites or indeed Greek society with. Islam, for example, which is which is obviously a, a big deal for a long period of time while it was under possession by the Ottoman Empire. But Assassin's Creed Odyssey does, and it was very enlightening. As a physical recreation of those places, I'm a lot less convinced by them. I mean, partly for just it's a, a game reasons, like they have to uh, massively condense the city and geography Um and curiously, though, actually, they, they almost entirely flatten one of the two very prominent hills in the city center of Athens. Like the Acropolis is on this huge peak that you can visible from nearly everywhere in the city. But right next to it is another peak of almost similar size uh, called the Hill of Panix. Although when I pronounced it that to some Greeks, they had no idea what I was saying. So uh, who knows what it's actually called. Um, but like, I assume there are like technical design reasons for, for squishing that second hill. Um, because some of the landmarks that appear on it are in the game. They're just lower. <laughs> uh, but I would have thought, you know, like just, you know, I, I, obviously I have no idea what the technical reasons were, but like I would have thought that like having an extra hill to occlude the horizon would be useful <laughs> in terms of performance. Well, and I imagine, I mean, you know, technology's improved a lot in the last couple of thousand years, so we don't need quite so much like <laughs> lord obstructing <laughs> geometry now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they really did have uh, trouble uh, loading in all those boats as, they were, as the Ottoman <laughs> Empire was about to siege the city. That's why they were caught unawares. Uh, they just hadn't loaded in. I, 
but I, I, I wondered if it was like maybe they wanted to give you like a, a less impaired, fluid downhill experience from the Acropolis to the coastline or something like that, you know, where they were, where they, they realized that they placed an objective somewhere on the other side of what would have been the Hill of Penix, apologies to the Greeks. And um, they realized that having a hill in the way was just too much of an obstacle for the player to get there fluidly or something. I was really interested to know because otherwise I would think that hill was quite an important, and exciting landmark. Uh, and it offers, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Anyway. There were a few things that made me a little bit suspect about the way they draw the ancient world. Like I, I think in general, like those games, I have a level of trust that they've they've scanned in the correct friezes and got advice from archaeologists about how they were painted or reassembled. But like, there's a room in the Acropolis which was, among other things, used as a treasury in the game. This is and. It's just a room that anyone can walk into that just has like <laughs> heaps of gold and stuff in it. Like, and they, I mean, it can't be right. I don't know whether the Greeks just filled the room full of gold and trinkets and just left it all higgledy piggledy. But I, I would think that somebody would have tidied up the official treasury of the Delian League. Like, maybe <laughs> put it in some boxes. It's not like the Greeks are fucking smaug. Like, the, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think I don't know. You know, I am not a historian by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. Let me just be very clear on that. But it does seem like whenever you talk to someone who is an expert in a historical, you know, uh, you know, period or situation or whatever, the thing that often marks out an expert is their ability to describe how much they don't know about stuff rather than how much they do know about stuff. Mm. And it seems like video games are probably quite a poor medium to adapt history into in a with a level of accuracy with that you know uh, there's a lot of requirements in video games for you know places to fight and uh, places to kick people into the sea and uh, <laughs> you know uh, and so i imagine that the the amount of bullshit to reality uh, historical record is pretty I imagine that's a pretty brutal uh, ratio. Um, yeah. But it's, it's no different from going to, you know, one of those horrible uh, historical reenactment <laughs> things at Warwick <laughs> Castle or whatever. Um, but, you know, I guess it's, you got you got to uh, praise the uh, effort they make. But yeah, I, I imagine it's, I mean, maybe, maybe maybe it's completely accurate. Maybe they got it bang on. <laughs> well, <laughs> Absolutely bang on. Maybe the counterpoint to that is the notion that, you know, I guess, like, I don't know, ancient, and medieval like castle architects were early level designers in many ways they were building <laughs> mm. they were building channeled experiences for people to fucking die in right <laughs> like that's you know they were thinking a lot about occluding line of sight and creating interesting pathways because they needed to create murder boxes in <laughs> you know it, a, a grand scale and that's probably, you know, in many ways a skill set that was deprecated for hundreds and hundreds of years as the orthodoxies of human conflicts changed until we came until we invented Robert Yang and Quake. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so uh probably probably not, but what if? Hmm? <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? anyway, I mean I, I totally agree. Like I, I my assumption was that uh and, and, you know, Assassin's Creed was going to be pretty but uh, yeah, uh, pretty stupid when it came to the actual history of it. So I was, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that it did such a good f uh, job of explaining the the context of the places you visit in the game in its tourist mode. Uh, but anyway, I I just wanted to get that out of my system because the actual game that I want to talk about is uh, a game from this year, which twist could have been in my top games of the year list. Uh, it's called Chance of Senar. Um with a double N and a double A. Uh, and it's a puzzle-led adventure game, as per Steam's characterization of what I play now, basically. Um, but the puzzle here is primarily one of translation. So you are this robed fella, awaking in a city built on the tiers of a ziggurat in a vast desert. And each tier is occupied occupied <laughs> by a different cast of this fictional society. And they're all they're all sort of involved in some vaguely unknowable ancient mystery of sun worship uh, upon which the ziggurat was seemingly founded. But their roles uh, in these different 
tiers in these different castes are so distinct and so strictly separated by tradition that they've ended up diverging linguistically and they've got these different languages and they don't readily understand one another and the game has you piece together these languages uh, and ultimately translate between them uh, either learning words from like the context of what people are doing when they're talking to you or occasional like fragments of Rosetta Stone like translation documents and stuff and signage you know there's a sign outside a, a place that's making pottery you can assume that the sign says something about pots so like uh, you know and there's also dialogue as well which is not voiced so it's, it's presented as text so that that you know, all of all of the stuff is is glyphs basically that you're translating, and a kid will babble some glyphs at you and then run off. And if you stumble across them again, he's like, "Yay, babble, babble!" And you can tell that some of those glyphs are the same from what he said before. And then you can infer from the context that he's playing hide and seek with you. So the words therefore are like maybe you seek me in the first context and you find me in the second context. And so you can you can go to this page and uh, where all the glyphs are that you've encountered end up being listed and you can click on them and write in whatever translation you, you you think fits tenses don't seem to be a thing so far but some of the languages do have different syntax from each other and there's different ways of pluralizing things and so forth so there's a sort of fun grammatical step as well as just translating these words and as you learn these languages you understand ways by which you might traverse between the tiers of the city and uh, climb up the ziggurat for purposes that Presumably your character knows, but you do not, which is interesting Like to compare it to Cocoon, because in both of those games, you have a, a you, you operate a protagonist on a clear mission, uh, but you do not know what that mission is. Uh, and yet somehow the, the path that you have to tread is, is very clear, not in obvious at any time. Um, and I quite like that trick. I, I don't know that it always it always works in, in games like this. I'm sure I've played a lot of games where I felt like my goal was not sufficiently um, motiv you know, motivating to me because I didn't really understand it very well. But somehow in Cocoon and this, like the drive forward is is very clear, even though you don't know why you're doing things and they're quite they all belong to like uh, traditions or mysteries that are on the face of them very alien to you. Um, but yeah, I, I, I love, the, I love the game. It's great. Uh, I do have a, a few frustrations with it, but it, it looks superb. It's got this glorious, almost cell shaded art style. It's gorgeous, restrained palette. Um, I really like the way the, the, the fictional desert culture has fractured into these casts, which each have a distinct culture and architectural and fashion style. Uh, even the, the kind of the way that the, the glyphs are written is, is very expressive. And there's, the Ziggurat is this beautiful place to explore, but it does have this, uh, this problem for me, particularly as my brain dies and my memory disappears, that it's not, uh, it's not presented as a contiguous space, but as a, as a series of environments that you, it's sort of 3D from an angle and you, uh, you move between you kind of click on a door and it go takes you to a new environment then but but the game has its own control over the camera angle and it does not necessarily keep that camera angle consistent between the environments which means that you know you'll be exiting off left screen somewhere and then you'll enter from the top of the screen in a new environment and that just completely fucks up my mental ability to map the place um, which is really important because the, the, the explorable space is like huge. Like the, I think the third tier of the ziggurat is something like the size of Bath. <laughs> it feels like, you know, <laughs> it, maybe if not larger, like I, I explored for about two or three hours the other night, just going from screen to screen without returning to my point of origin, which, which sounds fine. Just, you know, that would be fine in Elden Ring or something like that. But you have to remember this is a puzzle game and like key right. information well, that will help you parse the language. Maybe held in a single conversation in one location you visited several hours previously, and you need to pair that with new information that you get two hours away. And then, <laughs> there aren't many ways to cross-reference that information if you need it later. And like personally for me, it's just too hard for me to remember like the conversation, its location, or how to get back there. Um is it yeah. expecting you to sort of make your own notes or to kind of, you know, to be methodical from the outset to counter that? 
Yeah, I mean, it ultimately has has required me to do that, but I, I don't think the game intends you to do that because it does its scope is 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 for the first few hours limited enough, and it provides you with enough means of recording things yourself that you don't need like external uh, tips. Um, if if for example, there's a puzzle in the game. Uh, which provides you specific information that will be useful later. You also have access to that. And that your, your character like scribbles something down on a, on a notepad, piece of notepaper, and you can access that from the same menu that you can annotate glyphs. So, so like you know, you know, if if there's a a sequence of icons that are likely to become significant later, then you'll have a picture of those icons uh, in your wallet, as it were. Um, so it feels like it, it's uh, it's saying, "Don't worry, we've got your back. We've we've helped you fix this information." But then at other times, uh, I've uh, I've it, it, I've come a cropper by uh, you know relying on it. Um, you're not simply just guessing the words and, and, and jotting them down. You you do have that screen which collates all the words you've encountered, um, and then sometimes. Um, and, and oh, another thing to say is when you when you see these words in the environment, the speech or, or text then gets captioned with whatever words that you think it means directly in the environment. So you're not having to refer back to a separate screen all the time to get to your uh, translations. And the periodically the game will um, quiz you on a selection of words, like uh, in much the same way that. Uh, other information games like Obra Dinn allow you mm -hmm. to confirm info in batches. So you'll get quizzed on a, like three or four usually uh, words because they'll it'll open this book and they'll draw three or four illustrations and then you'll have to drop the relevant glyphs next to whatever verbal noun is being illustrated in those things. It, it, it usually works. On occasions, it's a little weird uh, because I feel like I would have had no idea at all what was being said were it not for the illustrations that my character somehow intuits from nowhere. Um, but on the whole, it's it's you know I, I don't mind that there's a, a step removed there. You can brute force some of them uh, if you have an inkling of what glyphs are likely to be in the pool. But generally, you do need to apply some degree of understanding to get those answers confirmed. One of my main annoyances is is that when you hear a new glyph uh, or see a new glyph, and it's just it just gets added to the end of the list of all the glyphs you've heard. And you can't rearrange them <laughs> into any order that might make sense. And it sort of drives me completely insane that I can't put verbs and nouns in separate areas. Right. And even, even like a number system has been given to me and the, the numbers aren't in any order. It's very, it's really annoying. Famously, um, numbers are... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But it's still a, a really great game. Uh, I really like that you aren't just translating words, but you're also translating the meaning of, of uh, rituals and traditions and idioms that are not only obscure to you, the player, but they also carry different meaning among the different castes. So one caste, for example, calls themselves devotees, but another caste thinks of them as the impure. Uh, and yet, they also that that uh, that bigoted cast venerate another cast who play music uh, called the chosen ones. But then you you can come in and you can actually help to break this sort of ignorance and bigotry down by translating between them and showing them the the casts that one of them thought was initially impure actually have a musical tradition as well, like the chosen ones. And so maybe they aren't so impure after all it doesn't like go deep on any of that kind of stuff but it's there i i really appreciate that and there's some stealth sections as well but they they're absolute wank so uh, yeah <laughs> yeah it looks but, yeah. i'm looking at screenshots it looks beautiful i think i find this sort of knowledge game um it's to the point jamie made earlier actually about completability i think um maybe this is my own ailing brain but I find that the one thing that you've said that kind of puts me off is scope, you know, like I love the idea that games exist to be almost like academic curio puzzles to engage someone for a really long time. I know that I would not do that. <laughs> mm. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. it is compartmentalized enough to be, uh, to be uh, an accessible challenge. I think, I think mm -hmm. it's just, uh, just at the brink of, of what my brain can cope with before it moves on. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, but it's 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 not it's not designed to be something studied and, and mulled over over years. It's, it is designed to be a a linear yeah, and transitory experience. I think, although there are clear puzzles throughout which uh, suggest that completists will find something later in the game which will allow them to return. Which, uh, which fills me with a sense of fear because I absolutely cannot remember where any of those things have occurred. But... Uh, you're allowed to not, probably. I mean, the, um, <laughs> it's funny. Hi, Chris. In, in Googling it, one of the, you know, probably due to an SEO win, one of the top, uh, I just did like a Google for screenshots, and one of the top images is from like a Xbox achievements database that clarify you know, the, the, those websites that kind of shake games down for their yield in easy gamer score. And that says that in 10 to 12 hours, you can expect a thousand gamer points. Oh, um, well, which is, you know, that given is the a, number of badges I've earned this year, you know what motivates me. Right, exactly. And so <laughs> I just, you know, just to, just to, if you, you know, that, that certainly motivated me, you know, that I think if something like that had been placed in front of um, my the academic pursuits of my university life, I probably would have um, finished middle March. <laughs> <laughs> Healing has, the has wounds that... of a fractured culture for gamer points. That's uh, <laughs> that's what I'm all about. Has anyone here finished middle March? I don't think I've started middle March. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough hang. I've got a friend whose favourite book is middle March and uh, it's, it's very hard to take them seriously because that book is... <laughs> That is just insane. That's the first time anyone's described that as a tough hang. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, tremendous, tremendous work. Is that all of the podcast there is? I ask on behalf of the lower left side of my face. I say to the lower le- yeah, left side of your face, yes, you may now painlessly kill Chris in his sleep. <laughs> Finally, at last. Well, it's good night from me. <laughs> <laughs> bye chris it's been real <laughs> it's been a tough hang frankly yeah do you know what's a tough hang the left wow. side of my face um it's um the uh, uh i hope everyone has a fabulous christmas and enjoys the rest of 2023 hopefully i'll play more than 16 video games in 2024 and be on the podcast more to talk about them at more or less length than I did anything I talked about today. Excellent. I hope everyone has a nice Christmas and I hope everyone's able to protect themselves from the scary things that happen at Christmas because, uh, you know, I know for a lot of people it's actually quite a tricky time. I'm one of those people. So I just wanted to say, yeah. look, af- look after yourselves because it's hard out there, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Actually, that's, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Enjoy this time that we have. I hope you don't have a toothache. <laughs> Fucking hell. <laughs> Marsh, help. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm off to kill God. So, uh, yeah. you, you absolute rascal. rascal. <laughs>